Okay, this is the 10th year of, of this series of artist talks that I've organized. And I want to thank Brett Steele uh, for his continuing generosity in letting me have this hall. Uh, this year, the talks are supported using public funding by the National Lottery through Arts Council Britain. Among the questions about artistic processes today are questions about mapping and its relation to the di digital. For some time now, the scope of the term mapping has been growing. A quarter of a century ago, cartographers defined maps as graphic representations that facilitate a spatial understanding of things, concepts, conditions, processes, or events in the human world. Now, the very way that maps are to be produced is being rethought. It is no longer about representations, it's about mapping. It seems to me that many artists are preoccupied with what are essentially problems of mapping. Looking ahead at the list of evening lectures at the AA, I noticed one in the Landscape and Urbanism series titled Making Maps. It's on next Wednesday in the soft room, I think. It considers the need to establish fresh foundations for cartography, and it suggests that contemporary art should, could serve as a model. Mapping, of course, does not have to involve digital, have to involve digital techniques, but such techniques are widely used in many different ways. And really, I want to just raise this as a question that goes across the whole series, how are we to understand the relation of the digital to the artistic activity of mapping? I have not asked the speakers to address themselves to these questions. They have been invited to talk about their work. They are not aware of the thoughts that went into my selection for this series. But across the three very different practices, we may learn something about mapping processes, processes and art. I would really like some feedback, and I noticed that on the um, um, website uh, for each talk, there is room for comments underneath. I don't know how many of you use that space, but I'd be very grateful uh, if you would do so after each talk. There are going to be three speakers uh, in this series, Claude Heath today, Anton Buldakov this Friday, and then after a few weeks, Adam Lowe of Facta Marte on Friday the 7th of March. Let me now uh, introduce Claude Heath. He will speak about his methods of drawing, which include blind drawing done through touch. His images of Ben Nevis, revolving animated maps, and paintings of constellations involve drawings in three dimensions with the aid of aerial photographs and computer software, and much else. Now, if this were to sound merely technical, I couldn't really resist. Um, I want to read a quotation. <laughs> Is this all right? You can't. <laughs> a quotation from a review uh, of the White Chapel Art Galleries the government art collection at work. This is the quotation. Sir John Sawyers, currently head of MI6, previously at the UN, used to invite hostile nations into his office to dwell upon the beautiful cobalt ground of Claude Heath's Ben Nevis on blue. All dots and doodles and just, just shy of figuration which was extremely helpful during some particularly heated negotiations on Iran, where the painting was used as a kind of soothing timeout for eyes and mind. Agreement, according to Sawyers, was reached an hour later. Claude has just taken part uh, in drawing making, making drawing a project at the drawing room in London. He has had solo shows across Europe, and at the Henry Moore Institute and Leeds City Art Gallery. He has participated in many group exhibitions, including at Saatchi Gallery and the British Museum. His work is in collections of the British Museum, the Deutsche Bank, Museum Kunstpalast Dusseldorf, and many, many others. His work is included in several publications, including The More I Draw, Drawing as a Concept for the World, and by Black Dog, Drawing Projects, published in 2011.
Claude's title is Drawing as the Mapping of Sensation. Please welcome him. Hello, thank you very much. Um, that's a lovely introduction. Um, I, think, I think I might end up touching on, on some of those last introductory points you made about mapping towards the very end when um, I start to talk a bit about some more recent things. If I can get that far, I often put too many slides in. So, But having said that, do interrupt me. Um, I'm happy to be interrupted and ask questions at any point. So um, I think the best thing is to launch in because often my um, when I talk about my work, uh, to present it to you in a way that will make sense of the techniques and the methods I'm using is to just start at the, where, at the point that I started from and to talk you through how I got to where I am now. So um, I could take you back now to 1995, drawing number, I think, 90-something of a series of 200 drawings that, uh, at this point, I was an unexhibited artist. Uh, I'd only just decided to, to be a full-time artist and to commit myself to that. Um, I had this idea that um, somehow, looking back on it, I think I, I needed to to reinvent my own personal wheel, if you like, my, my art wheel. <laughs> and um, so I started almost with a, a sort of um, a blank canvas, um, it, conceptually, uh, how do I get some marks on my page and that they mean something to me uh, in a way that um, will also have some kind of authenticity um, and somehow bypass the problems that I'm feeling of to do with aesthetic choice. I wanted to, to sort of put aside aesthetics. Of course, you never can, but I also wanted to put aside my knowledge about things. So I thought, well, I read that in art schools people do blindfold drawing, so I thought, well, I'll try that. And the, um, the process began with taking a, bl uh, a, um, a life cast of my brother. This is my brother Toby. N not you. <laughs> but um, Toby's at that time was in his 20s, He's, um, it was a half cast of his head, so it was like not the full head, but just the front part, including the ears. And um, we were making casts of all my family at the time, so it's kind of a, a different project to do with a family project. Um, so that was a handy object, and also it was an interesting one to see if I could um, try to separate what I know, in other words, that it's a head, that it's Toby, that it looks in a certain way, from what I feel. And that was, if you like, the injunction I was given as a, as a young artist was not to draw what you know, but to draw what you feel, what you can see. So if you take see, as uh, that's what, how Ruskin would have talked about it, uh, draw what you um, see and not what you know, then I took it down to another register, which is to draw what you can feel uh, as a form of sensation full stop. Um, and later on I came back to what you might call vision. Um, what happened next was, well, I took this life cast, uh, I put it on the wall in my studio, I created a triangle, if you like, between me, the paper and the object. So uh, the only thing interposing uh, on the sheet was a little piece of blue tack at the top there where you can see that all the lines are originating from. and. Um, over a period of thing, in this case about an hour and a half, I drew this live cast using my left hand to touch it and my right hand to draw what I was touching. So it's a bit like a, a sort of a transcription method of, of taking something three-dimensional and making something 2D from it. Um, making something 2D from it sounds a bit simplistic, actually. It's kind of a uh, sort of an impossible process of compression or something. You take something that's re real and solid and you somehow there's this instinct to make something flat from it. Um, so it was a way to look at that and to, and to play with that. Um, so moving through the series, I, I thought, well, I'm going to see this through. I had to been advised by someone that uh, if you think it's interesting, just make 200 of them. <laughs> In a standard piece of art school advice, I think. Um, but quite a good piece of advice. So I started to think, do things like... Um, look at using different colours to represent different stages of the drawing. So in this case, green would be in the back, the first layer, and then into um, red, 
and then into black, so that later on I would be able to see how I progressed throughout that sort of that uh, exposure to the object and through the drawing. Um, and that became quite useful because uh, I also turned these into wall drawings uh, that would go into galleries as I began to exhibit those as an extension of the drawing process. So I don't see drawing as stopping and once you finish making the drawing, but you actually continue that out into a different, different spaces. So, um, and when I make these as wall drawings, I would then be able to see the green go on first, the, the red, then the black. So I get to see for the first time how the drawing was made, if you like, process step by step. Um, the slides I have tonight are mostly to do with drawing because that's the, the sort of thread that runs through everything I make. Um, but um, I could sort of show you lots of other things that are sort of more like... Um, uh, exhibited pieces of, uh, you know, ex exhibition pieces, you could call them, or wall drawings, but I'm just trying to see if I can show you um, the common thread. So here I've tilted the head, and here I've tilted it again, and this time I've used uh, the same sort of colours actually, red, green and black, but a very sort of muted, uh, thinned out inks. So it's almost like a transparency. Um, and I should mention, of course, that um, when you're drawing from touch, you can basically draw anything that you can touch. It doesn't matter if you can see it or not, because if I wanted to, I could draw the back of this. Even though I haven't seen it, it's still within reach. So there's a sense that you, you can basically, uh, as long as you can reach it, you can translate it into a mark of some kind, um, which is quite a powerful thing when you realize that the limitations of, of vision in that sense. So. Um, Although, again, this is a, a drawing of a, a half a head, if you like. So there is a slight an illusion, if you like, of, of um, if you like, the whole of the head. Uh, to give you a bit more flavour <coughs> of how the drawings are made, here's this, the life cast, Toby. Here's, um, he's tilted forward in this case. He's on a pole so that I can twist the pole and then change the angle of the head at any point. At the top there, you can see at the top of his very top, there's a little dark patch, um, which is a piece of blue tack that's been well thumbed at that point. Um, and then there's, a, there's traces of, um, um, if you like, the, my, my touching the object over a period of months. So uh, the drawing behind it is, a, is, say, about a foot behind it on the wall. It's, um, the, the drawings are no more than, say, a metre high. In this case, it was a series of about 12 drawings that were made from the same object. But as I, as I tilted it, turned the head, so um, it's basically like a, a snapshot of different stages, like a revolving of the, of the head. Um, and I've used a multicolored biro, so one of those ones that has about sort of 15 different colors, and you, but in a random um, <coughs> alternation, so I'm not sure which color I'm using. And uh, when you put all the drawings together, um, they, they basically they begin to resemble if you like a 3D scan that where the mathematics has been taken out and you're left with a kind of a, um, uh, an agnostic uh, handmade 3D scan of something that's, that appears to be moving. Um, so the, the, the amassing of the lines, so all, if this drawings take about an hour, that they tend to sort of suggest the volumes and uh, and so you have to make more drawings to investigate am I just being seeing something that's suggested or is it something that I can pull apart a bit more here's uh, another drawing from a bit later on where I started to use color on the right side uh, you can see it more clearly where she, she's got red which is near then it goes back into green and then black so if I remember rightly that that's how that's the order um, it's from 1998, um, and this is the Venus of Willendorf, a little prehistoric figurine, which was in a museum in Vienna. I've never seen the real thing, but I've seen casts of it, and I've got one cast of it in my family. So um, I thought, well, I'd draw that blindfold. Um, <laughs> so that was, that was really interesting, and this is a series of about um, five drawings on the same sheet, because she's a small figurine, only three or four inches high. Um, so old that really no one knows what, what they were for and what they meant. 
I'm actually quite interested in prehistoric art anyway. Um, and I made paintings on that and, and wall drawings, so recreating the line line by line. So, the head of Buddha. Um, and you can see I was just pushing the technique in, in various directions. Um, and here it gets a little sculptural, uh, about the same sort of size, a little sculptural bronze of him. And although nothing has changed, uh, the, the object hasn't been moved, uh, I haven't moved, the paper hasn't moved, of course every time it's totally different. It's, uh, there's a different spreading out, and if you like, a different mapping, you know, it's a, a different projection, you could say, if we're talking about mapping. Um, because, say, the one second on the left is definitely spreading in a different direction to the one in, on next to it on the, other, on the uh, right side. Um, this sort of reminds you of when people put their heads on photocopiers and they, and they sort of roll their head as, it, as the photocopier is going across. You end up with a kind of a moving sort of translation of, of the head. But anyway, um, this is... This sort of series of works prompted some curators at, at Henry Moore Institute to say, okay, well, let's do an experiment on you. Let's, let's release you on our collection of sculptures up in Leeds, and uh, we'll put you in a basement. It was an audio-visual basement, um, so there was no light, and we had, um, I think, about five sculptures brought into me that I could touch over a period of about two weeks. And the idea was I would never see them, and I would uh, just draw them by touch and see what I could find out. So it's, it's a kind of exercise in remote sensing, I thought, at the time. If it's a bit like a satellite. I, I was a satellite that was exposed to these uh, objects, and I was going to see what images they were going to beam back to me. So this is one of the objects. It was clearly a hand, but it turned out to be Epstein's own hand, a, a sculpture, not a cast, but a sculpture of it. Um, and again, I've rotated it across until I found, um, after the series of drawings was made, that uh, the one second from the end on the, on the right was, if you like, the most perspicuous version of it. It was the, most, um, the best way to sort of, if you like, get a handle on all the different wrappings of fingers. And, and then I went on to make another drawing, keeping it in that position. So I was not looking at the object at that point, but I was trying to extend the drawing. So, so it's a paradox, isn't it? You, I'm using drawing to, to, to draw things that I, don't, that, that I hope I don't know, that I'm feeling, but I'm using that to find out things about things. So it's a, it's a strange mix-up of, of uh, imperatives. So you've got um, peeling an orange when you're blindfold? That was an interesting experience. <laughs> that was um, on a residency in Spain. And uh, the painting that came out of it. So often, I very, I very often translate my marks into uh, dots. So, if you like, take away the gesture and leave just the content, if you like. Just leave the, the patterning, the uh, take one step back from the drawing and just see what I've got. So, one way to do that is to, is to use dots. Going back to the Leeds uh, <coughs> exhibition. Um, one of the other subjects that they gave me as objects was a sculpture, a very, about so high, very gnarly sort of bronze surface. I wasn't sure what it was. I thought it might be a, a bird with a sort of sculpture of a bird with big feet and a sort of big lumpy body with some feathers at the top. It turned out to be Anthony Caro's Smiling Woman from 1956. So very, very um, untypical of him, but... Uh, before he moved into abstraction, but um, I went back later on to look at the drawings to see if there was a smile in there. But uh, <laughs> um, who knows? I mean, I think there is a, a sense of something around the mouth area there, but um, certainly wasn't a bird. Uh, this is the object. He's, um, <coughs> and it's actually a very nice sculpture, but when I, when I was in the bookshop and the museum, I was flicking through some material and I came across a little photograph, this photograph, in one of the brochures. And, of course, immediately I knew that was the object I'd been drawing for a week, <laughs> uh, not knowing what it was. So I had to stop that series. Uh, that's an interesting thing that happened, but um, later on I made a, 
two wall drawings in Toronto based on, um, as well as one at the Henry Moore Institute, uh, taking the same drawings, but basically taking the color out. Um, in this case, it was using the same idea I had done with the Venus, where you have different colors for near and far. So in this case, I think the yellow is right at the back. It's the back of the object. And the blacks are the close quarters. So take the color out, and you're left with a series of points, and different, differently spaced, differently sized points. So there's a pers perspective, and that's one of the things I kept coming back to was that um, the sense of touch actually has an inbuilt sense of perspective. There's a, there's a depth there, and, and it's a, an intuitive one, isn't it? Because you have near and far. Um, and so a lot of the wall drawings were actually trying to extend on t that idea. Um, can't see it too well here, but the uh, rather like the peeling orange one, um, this is a whole series of dots that, that are differently spaced. So moving on, I, I then got to a point where I did a residency at Wimbledon School of Art. They gave me a little <coughs> studio, did have windows this time, and um, I was drawing from plants. I wanted to use my eyes this time. I was trying to now see if I could use them as fingertips. So the having developed all this uh, sensitivity around touch and about how to put it onto a page, um, I wanted then to do the same for sight. So. This is a little bit more tricky to explain the technique because it's, um, although it's still a, just a drawing of a plant, um, I arrived at a, a sort of bizarre way of drawing two sheets at the same time. So um, if you imagine the, the plant is here, sitting on the table, I was drawing on an upright board uh, which had a piece of paper on it. And there was also a piece of paper underneath the table. Uh, and I was drawing with both hands at the same time while my eyes were moving around the, around the object. Okay, so as architects, I don't know if there are architects here, but if you have the bottle top, which is a circle, um, if you're drawing it, if you like, a projection down onto the, onto the lowermost sheet there, you'd have a circle. And if you were looking at the side elevation, you just have a short line, which is a circle seen from the side. Um, but of course, if you have a plant, which is full of amazing shapes, that move through many, many different um, changes, um, then you have a lot of interesting um, arena. So these plants are wonderfully adept at uh, filling up space and catching light and water. So um, there was no shortage of, of spatiality to, to get to grips with, in, even in just a small set of plants that you, know, you brought in to the studio. So um, you have a top view, which is uh, the side the side aspect of these two plants sitting on the table, and below is the top view, if you like, the projection as it would be seen from above the table. So you can imagine my eyes are moving around, sometimes my fingertips too, working in conjunction, because if I couldn't see part of the plant, I would just reach around and touch it, and then draw that as well. So they were working all in conjunction, and uh, resulted in drawings like that, and this. So some of these little plants are drawn on the reverse sides. Maybe I should use my laser pointer. It's, uh, it's this one. So this plant here was drawn on the back of this here and on also on the back of, whoops, Rudia, is drawn on the back of this one too. So this drawing is a drawing of that one. And that one is also drawn on the back of that sheet there. So it's a very multi-dimensional thing. <laughs> And uh, to actually see the drawing, you've got to walk around it, basically. So you have to... Uh, photographs aren't really going to do it justice, in other words. <laughs> but uh, this one is a bit easier to talk about because it's just two views of the same thing. And it's a habitual thing I seem to do now, and it seems to be a natural one, which is to put um, the texture of the object on one side and, if you like, the mapping or the... the um, I call it the... Uh, the schematics of it or the organization of it onto the other side it's the I the ideas the conceptual side of it so this is in, the, in this case a eucalyptus grows in a, in a very patterned way so like a spirals that, that move through space um, and I was trying to record the way that those spirals are moving on the on the right side so you've got essentially they're like conversations between two 
sheets to two planes that are just you know in different spaces, and and that's how I saw it because the line would just wander off and go on to the next in the next panel. So I don't know if it's possible to see it here, but maybe you can see that some of the lines go off to the side and uh, go on journeys on to other drawings. So I th you see it as a conversation. Why not take away the, the, the board and just uh, look, draw on transparency? Um, so, or why not just draw on one transparency, two views of the same thing, which is, in this case, a mountain Ben Nevis, as Parvin mentioned. Um, and that is from the, another residency. It seems to me that residencies are a theme here, doesn't it? But it's, I think that's when you get time to, to just step away from your normal... Um, studio practice and and to put yourself in a position where you have to make something um, and it can be very very good um, the University of Cambridge for a year as their artist in residence at Kettle's Yard um, around about 2003 I think it was and they have a wonderful um, li library of uh, aerial photography so you walk in there's, there's banks and banks of un I think so far undigitized um, large format photography of the UK going back to the 60s and I thought I'd be able to find uh, the first thing that came to my mind was not you know where I live which you might do with say Google Earth but might be to look up where John Latham did his thing called um, uh, Nidri Woman which is uh, basically taking slag heaps in Scotland from next to mines and naming them as public artworks so changing something that's basically an eyesore to the local community and to something that's public art or could be owned by them. But they didn't have photographs of that. So I ended up looking at uh, Ben Nevis and, and other things, areas uh, around Ben Nevis that are like an oil refinery, um, they sort of man-made versus natural landscapes. But how did I get the two drawings from photography? Because you ha the plane flies basically over the landscape and it takes a series of shots. And where those shots overlap, you can then put them in a stereoscope, which I think you probably know what that is. Um, put them in a stereoscope with mirrors, and you end up with a, a 3D view of that landscape. It's, because of the, the photographs are so beautifully uh, rendered, you have an incredible detail. So it's like looking down onto a, a miniature landscape of um, very high definition. Um, so... What they, you, because it's in 3D, you can then extrapolate, if you like, what the mapping is, which is the, the view from above, you might, might say, the lower part here. Um, from that, you can extrapolate this, the height. Even though you're not at ground level, you can imagine it, you can feel it, because it's, it's, it's coming up at you. I mean, I basically have... I could show you this, which is the, the source image for that drawing. Um, which is the two, I think, eight by, eight by eight inch prints, put them side by side under the mirrors, and that becomes a fully dimensional landscape with a cloud between you and the top of the mountain, and the top of the mountain between you and the valley that's way, way below. So it's a, it's a beautiful, um, and it's temporal because the cloud has moved and the plane has moved. It's, it's very subtle. If you, if you reverse the images, put them the other way around than they're supposed to be, uh, as if the plane was flying backwards, you get a negative landscape. So you get uh, you get the valley that coming up, and the top of the mountain zooming down. So it's a, a very it starts you to think about vision, um, and get starts you to make more questions about um, what is a landscape and how do we look at it. Um, this is how I look at these drawings. I put them in these boxes and hang them on the wall. So you can hang them in any orientation you like or you can put them next to each other or just have them on their own. This is the oil refinery I think I mentioned. Ben Nevis and another view. Fun to use colour, like I've done with the other things uh, that we've talked about, the, the, the um, uh, Venus and the other things. Using colour to just separate out and to organise your sensations, if you like. Um, a bit like, I suppose you think, you probably know the quote from Cezanne, where he just, uh, he just asks that art organises our sensations for us. Um, 
So we have a mess of things that happen to us and art helps us to put it in order. Um, but I, I think that the, the mess is interesting because um, it, it always makes me think of the, the, the wobble in the line that Sol LeWitt had in one of his prints. I think in, in the 80s he did a print. He sent it to, it was a woodcut, he sent it to Japan to get it, um, to get a proof back to, for approval. And um, he was looking at the, at the proof and thinking there's something, something interesting and something good about this, but I don't know what it is. And then he looked really closely and the cutters had actually followed every single wobble in his pen drawing. So although it was a perfect arc, it was called arcs, arcs from four corners, where he had drawn it as a, as a scheme, they'd actually followed every single wibble wobble. So that makes you know, think the, the wobble is actually where it's at, you know. And he looked at it and, and um, decided that that was fine. That was still within his concept and he was going to keep that. So um, there's the wobbles. Anyway, that, that's my take on things. But um, these are all from um, museum shows quite often in Germany where, the, where um, drawing has, has been put in the forefront, I think, as a kind of a tool for uh, mixing up the, the genres, if you like. And um, this particular show was in Baden-Baden, and it was called Against the Grain, where drawings been used to go against the grain. Put the plant's drawings on the table. It's all about being able to walk around and see things. Um, and now we get into the same, same topic, Ben Nevis, but different approach. So. Uh, around this time, someone said to me, well, in, here in Edinburgh College of Art, we've got a, a technique for drawing in 3D, which is um, haptic. So you can draw your marks in space, in free space, freehand, and still be able, and then be able to feel them and touch them and, and manipulate them. So I took, the, I took the plane, got up to Edinburgh, tried out this thing, and I've been a guinea pig for them ever since about 2006, 2004, I think. Um, and they're just about to go on the market with it, but um, the, essentially it allows you to draw anything you want in 3D um, using this uh, haptic tool. So if you, I don't know if you're aware of haptic technology where you have an arm that is connected to your drawing um, input. It's like a, a mouse that moves in space, but it has a physical arm that connects to it. So if I, if I draw this as my mark, then I can actually um, go back and touch the mark that I've just made. So it gives you it gives you a resistance from the arm. So whereas otherwise it moves in free space. So it's a, it's a very bizarre technique, but it actually releases you from thinking about just uh, making something, taking something from three dimensions and putting it into two D. You know, in this case, you're taking something from three D and putting it into into three D. So uh, it's a three-dimensional drawing. Um, but just to complicate it, as I like to do, I drew, uh, my source in this case was a drawing. So <laughs> it was taking something that's 2D and making something that's 3D out of it. And I, I then became all quite, you know, as you probably are yourselves, disenchanted with even these this terms 2D, 3D, and it's all, it's all a very mixed up sort of terminology. Um, here's the same drawing seen from different angles. And then you have a uh, wall drawing that's made, and this is in Austria, um, from the, not the 3D drawing, but from a hand drawing of Ben Nevis. Back into 3D, uh, this is a drawing of a little pot plant from a different drawing system, 3D one, which is um, much bigger scale, so there's no haptics involved. It's, you just basically can draw in a very large pocket of space in front of you, all around you, in fact. And if you want to, you can look at a screen and see what you're doing, but I found that very discom discombobulating, so I just didn't, didn't bother with that. And did these drawings of plants again. Turned it into a wall drawing. This is a little plant from, I think it's, um, um, I can't remember the Latin name for it now, but, but basically it's, it's not just the plant, it's the space around it that I'm drawing. So the wall drawings become a very different proposition because I'm not giving away the, everything about the drawing itself. I'm actually 
putting up on the wall, if you like, half the information and allowing your eyes and my eyes to, to fill in the gaps. So in this case, the drawing itself, the 3D drawing, would have been, say, say f about three or four cubic metres or so of big space. If you imagine this table here times six or something like that. So it's a, it's a big drawing, it's expansive. And uh, I think it got even bigger than that. So how do you make a, you know, how do you make a, a wall drawing that reflects all of that depth and space in there? This is my answer to that. But um, I've been carrying around this book for a long time, which is a 3D atlas of the stars and galaxies. Um, and you put little red green glasses on, and it becomes 3D. It's all based on satellite measurements, so it's actually sort of scientifically um, correct in some way. Um, not that, that that's important, it's just the idea that you have this, this map of everything out there that, uh, that you can um, access quite easily. So all the different shapes here are different types of spiral galaxies, different, um, different types of clusters and so on. So when you put your 3D glasses on, they of course separate out and back into space and it becomes very, very rich. Um, and in my case, I did a one in that big workspace with the 3D uh, I was just talking about. I did a version of that map using so taking the, th the red and green um, based map and um, tra translating that in my handmade my wobble wobble method, if you can call it, um, into a 3D drawing. So here you can see there's a big S. That image there, which is somewhere in there, um, I couldn't tell you where. And then you go in, into the gallery. In this case, it's in, in a place called Locarno One, which is in in um, Holland. It um, doesn't exist anymore, I don't think. And then you sit in the gallery and you can appreciate those two wall drawings as as a stereoscopic experience. So in the middle of the space is a little stool where you can perch and you look through the stereoscope, which are two mirrors basically, um, pointing at each wall, and the two wall drawings become 3D. And that, that leaves a, a very bizarre um, effect because you, um, apart from it being 3D and, and you know it's not, um, when people walk into the space and walk around, uh, they're in 2D, and, was, and the work is in 3D, so um, because you're only seeing them in one eye, if that makes sense. But you're seeing the work in, with two. Um, and I've made another stereoscopic thing, which, which is a forward-facing stereoscope, where um, if you're looking at the work and seeing that in 3D, and you'll see the same person walk past the work and then walk past again. So you see the... It's very, very bizarre. But uh, it's very interesting, and the people... Um, respond to it very strongly, um, not least because it changes the space that you're sitting in, but without needing to be plugged in, without needing to be, it's not, it's not electronic, it's, it's physical if in a sense, it's on the wall. So actually these, that mark there, the S shape, will then, when you're looking through those mirrors, become right up, you know, close to you and the other marks will be receding way back. Um, I think I was very lucky that that worked. I think it was technically wildly ambitious to even try, but it, somehow it worked. So I'd also do works on paper just to kind of play around with the drawings because um, when you have a 3D drawing in, the, in your computer, you can't really you know, access it unless it's in the physical form. Uh, you can rotate it to the heart's content, but um, in some cases I like to to take something that doesn't really cry out for drawing, which is a musical um, score from 1935. You can just see it up there. It's called Quest by John Cage. A very short, like, 30-second piece he wrote in his early sort of stages, and um, possibly even incomplete. Um, but I just thought it'd be lovely to try and draw it in 3D in, in this big workspace and to see if I could do something with that. Um, and so as you rotate it and you work on it, and so I'm, I, in a way I'm working blind because I'm, although I'm following a score, I'm not looking at the screen that I'm um, 
producing the, the marks as I, as I work. I'm um, just taking the, pro the idea, if you like, and seeing it through as a process. Um, and that doesn't always work out as you think it might. Um, there's a bit of interference on the far right there. You can see where the magnetics have has reacted with something metal in the room and it's thrown all the lines off, which is, there it is. Nothing much to say about that, but um, taking it into a drawing again, um, one way of taking back that particular experiment and making something from that is, um, is in this way, like a concertina. Or going back into sense of touch, um, uh, someone, an archaeologist, asked me to go and play with his um, recently ex excavated uh, objects from the prehistoric objects from uh, a dig in Romania. Um, and he had the, scent, the idea, he saw the uh, Venus of Willendorf image and thought um, in a talk that I was doing and thought that um, that would be a good technique for him to find out more about his objects. Whether or not that happened or not, I don't know, but um, it certainly was part of the, the general process of analysing these objects. And um, in this case, this is a um, scored and scalpeled and uh, pierced drawing using, a, using a basically a knife and the object itself, which was a prehistoric flint axe head, an axe head that had a, a, a modern handle put onto it. There's another drawing of the same, the same object. So what I've done is I've simply uh, rocked the, the cutting edge of, of the axe head across the, the page, a bit like a, a mezzotint uh, printmaker might do where you score the surface and, until you get a, a sort of a fuzzy surface you can draw on. But in this case, it's just left a, a sort of trail of, um, of the edge so I've used the tool itself to make a drawing of the tool, if you like. Um, it's a very sort of sculptural drawing, this one. Um, more recently, I did um, a, wall, a series of wall drawings in, in the Pinakothek de Moderne in Munich for uh, a new building they had in their grounds, which is uh, it's a temporary building called the Schausteller. And it was to, it's a sort of space that's used or for dance, for music, DJs, readings, you name it. It was all happening in this space. And uh, the, this, this particular drawing goes back, or the source for this drawing goes back a few years, but um, it was a good opportunity to make it uh, for the first time. And so the, these are waterfalls. They are drawn from videos of water. They are a sort of collection of water as it does its thing including waterfalls, streams, rivers. And uh, what I've done is taken this 3D drawing technique and tried to recreate the, the sense of what I'm seeing um, in 3D. And of course, the different stages of the drawing are, if you like, different sculptural stages. So um, uh, I've taken, and funny enough, I took the, in the architectural context where we are, the top domes at the top were based on uh, the Hagia Sophia, if I pronounce that right. Um, in uh, Istanbul, and um, and I sort of then morphed and took those shapes and extended them and dragged them out and made made them into a waterfall, basically. So the the technique is able to to um, take a shape and then basically do what you want with it. Uh, so this is the haptics haptic tool, and this is the the other set of wall drawings that go with it. The um, in this case, I've just used a very simple method, uh, rather like I've shown you with the wall drawing of the plant on, on if you like, the reverse. This is on uh, a negative version of that, of that approach. So I've left a lot of space there for the, for the viewer to fill in the, the gaps. Now this brings us up a little bit more to um, closer things, uh, more recent things, because I spent the last few years looking at video of people moving. So, um, in fact, one particular clip of video, uh, so uh, about three minutes long, it's of architects that are interacting. So, funny that, it's a nice coincidence. Um, architecture seems to be a little theme that runs through, but um, these architects are working on a competition bid and they are trying to thrash out a, a, 
a particular design problem, a spatial problem. And uh, in this video clip, they're, they're actually, um, for want of a better word, they are sort of make, making gestural maquettes. You know, that's actually a phrase that my, my um, sort of mentor on this project, Professor Patrick Healy, Healy, that's one of his phrases for it. So with gesture, over the plans and elevations, collectively, they are um, using gesture to sort of build temporary buildings, if you like, on top of the plans, and they are um, using those, those sort of invisible objects uh, to solve design problems, which is, I think, probably a very, very common practice in, in architecture. And it's a very... Um, very subtle process, very complex, and the number of times I've watched this video, I can't tell you, but uh, the more I look at it, the more I see, and there's a, the, the use of space in communication is, is, uh, is actually central. So, what does this drawing, we're looking at a tracing of, I think I have an image, I'll show you. No, I don't. I don't, but um, it's a long scroll, um, about sort of 10 meters long. It's the different stages of, of that interaction between these sort of four, I think, four or five artists, uh, architects, who, um, so I've taken, I, I've used the, the long scroll, if you like, to stabilize the video, because whoever made the video, the ethnographic research, has been zooming in and out. So it's a very um, sort of patchy clip, but I've used the drawing to, to stabilize it and to work out exactly what spaces they're using and how, and to visualize it through drawing. Now this drawing doesn't tell you that particularly, but it looks at gaze patterns and the movement of their bodies back and forth. Um, whereas in the literature on human interaction, on c in cognitive science, uh, this is the sort of way that they represent these kind of moments. Uh, it's often cartoon-like, it's often um, arrows and dotted lines to represent actually very complicated and very spatial things. So it, it radically flattens them. And um, in, this, in this case, this is a lecturer who's addressing an audience. So look, like I am, I'm making sort of uh, gestures without reciprocation. But um, whereas the, the architects working together, that is a shared and reciprocal thing. Um, but oh, you can see a detail of, of part of that scroll. Um, so it's actually all one long sheet. But to fit it on the image and to show people, I've made this. Um, so how do you then make sense of the spaces that they're using and, and where they're using the spaces and how? Um, so I've just been trying to devise, a, I feel like, a recipe for, for um, cognitive scientists, basically, to interpret video and to look at how space is used in communication. So it's something that I've just, just about to publish. And um, this is not even the best example to show you, in fact, but it gives you a, a sense of the direction. Um, essentially, in the, in the literature, people don't like to talk about things that they can't touch and can't see. So if these gestural maquettes, you can't see them, you can't touch them, you can't talk about them. But actually, they are very real. And they, are, they exist for that moment. Um, and so it is worth visualizing them and touching them, uh, sort of giving them a visible form and talking about them. Uh, the colours are, um, they are, <coughs> different um, architects have been colour coded. So the, the red guy uh, is, uh, he's the one, so he's the junior architect. He's, um, green guy is the, the lead architect who's actually running the meeting. Uh, and he's the one sitting, say, right at furthest on the left. Um, <coughs> next to him is red and... Basically, red is, is taking the, the design problem off the sheet and lifting it right up into space. And you can see on that point there, he's drawn a little space and talked about a window up and up and above the table. So he's he's actually activating the, the space above the table, um, and then other people later on take that and do other things with it. They reactivate it, play with it, and edit it in a sort of communication way. I'm not saying that this is um, so art. What is the shape? Which is the, 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 the shape um, that the, 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 the 
The yellow, I think, is really just my way of trying to show the, the, sh the bits of space that are actually being shared, that actually are being manipulated as a group. So it's um, the yellow don't read anything into the colours. It's just uh, a, um, if you like, um, it's a way to to make these things invisible things visible, but without. Is that, is that one with the <coughs> Most of them are. Yeah, the yeah, but also it's it's also the contribution, the, the, the spoken contribution at that time, plus the gesture, makes uh, it makes um, something real. So. It's one thing if you're just waving your arms in the air, but if you're actually talking about something and um, articulating it so that our people can do something with it, then it becomes something shared. Uh, especially if other then people then take it up and play with it, which is what happens in this case. Um, so it's a very difficult thing, and what I've tried to do is get away from representing the gestural maquette as if it was a little architectural maquette sitting on the table, in, but only in a ghostly form. I'm actually not looking at that, I'm looking at the space, just the space, because that's the bit that's being used. Um, and when you talk about sort of qualitative space, you can't visualise it, you never will be able to visualise it as such, but you can point towards it and, and say there's something happening here, something really interesting. And there's a lot of resistance to doing that because you, it's not physically tangible. Um, so... The, the result of all this work uh, and sort of theorising about it is that you can then uh, say, well, it is possible to discuss it at least. So it's a way to f to feed drawing into the community, into the research community, essentially. And that's pretty much where I'd like to stop because, um, although it's recent and it's not even the most pertinent thing to show you from that series, it's just because that's still in progress. Um, I thought it might be worth showing it because, not because there might be architects here, but just because um, it shows you the, the full circle of starting from blindfold drawings in 95. So um, going through to working on long scrolls. So here's some books uh, that, I'm, that I think one at the top that you mentioned is this lovely show in Germany, um, The More I Draw, and Drawing Projects you also mentioned as well. I don't want to promote myself or anything. This is just, these are not my uh, monographs. They're just really interesting books about drawing. So, um, what is drawing? One of whom, Ray Smith, was a set designer, scenographer. And that's the one against the grain, uh, Gegen den Strick, which is new forms of drawing, Gustav Baden Baden. Um, and so, I think there are always a continuing series of draw of exhibitions that throughout Europe and beyond that, that take uh, the plasticity of drawing and do interesting things with that. So I think that's my last slide. Okay, you take questions, presume. Of course, yes. There's a mic here if anybody wants to start. Well, I know that project isn't um, finished, hmm. but um, in what form, what visual form do, do, does it appear? Is it going to be the scroll form itself or some transformation of, of that? Um, the, final, the final form it might take will probably be, well, I have sketchbooks that are um, sort of packed with studies of those spaces, but they are kind of, um, they, they can either be integrated into an animation or they might just become a large book. So if you take all of the key uh, frames from that three-minute series mm. and you print them up, uh, you get a pile of paper about that big, that thick. So I can see how the drawing gets into that complexity and starts to pull it apart. It might be a book, who knows. Oh, I've got a microphone coming, sorry. Is the beauty of the piece important to you? Because some of them are quite exquisite. And um, I wonder whether, what value you give to that and your work. Uh, I think, well, thank you, but it's, it's um, yeah, I mean, it's paradoxical, isn't it? Because I started out saying I wanted to get away from aesthetics, which is why every time you get something that looks good, you kind of have to move on and 
think, well, um, perhaps I'm getting too good at that. I need to change the ball game. And, and, you know, you could say it's just pulling the rug slightly so that you move on. But I think that beauty, if you want to call it that, is a byproduct. It's not, if you have an idea and you see it through, then even if it's ugly in some sense, it, there might be a beauty in the fact that it's been well executed or well played out or something like that. So I think it's, yeah, it's a tricky, it's a double-edged word, beauty, isn't it? Especially in think in the art world, I think it's uh, beauty's got layers of meaning that not, maybe contemporary artists don't always feel comfortable about, you know. Um, but there you go. <laughs> what is being brought into being mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at some level. And therefore, you know, it's, it's still kind of like unresolved that, it's, that, that we respond uh, by finding it beautiful um, is in a sense Related to the fact that we don't, it's not an object which we know and know how to judge and find it beautiful. Mm. Yeah. It's rather that somehow beauty comes towards you out of it, which is a kind of different way of running the question of the beautiful. Mm. I must say, I, I found the whole presentation uh, absolutely kind of gripping, but also extremely difficult to uh, rehearse in one's mind as to you know, what is it mm. that I'm looking at. It seemed to me, intuitively, that one way of putting it is to say that you take drawing, and you could argue it's always been like this, but it you take drawing away from its conventional function of representing into drawing as fabrication, mm. in some sense. That, 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 you're ab that it is abandoning the field of representation in favor of fabricating. Now, and I think that's true across a range of, uh, I know what to call them, media, hmm. in a sense, which are groping um, with difficulty but with surprise as to what happens when they stop being representational and become kind of fabrication. Right. As such, the, the, the very proposition would have really kind of enormous kind of consequences for how one even began to try to define uh, the field of artistic practice. Um, now, within that, what, what seems to me so extraordinarily telling is that in, fabri in the fabrication, I mean, starting with the heads, what seems to be, I mean, you could almost say the object that begins to come out, and you yourself have used the term, is the gesture. And I think that, again, I mean, you know, in 50 years' time, if people play a recording of this, uh, they will, uh, you know, think it to have been almost a correct prophecy. Um, because I, I think the, the gesture is kind of fundamental mm. to it. 
I think the last thing is that related to gesture. It's got something to do with how something in motion is represented as being kind of still. Yes, definitely. Uh, definitely. And that's to do with the fabrication. So what, what this belongs to, despite its static character, is actually to a field of animated fabrication right. as opposed to static representation. Okay, I can, I can see that. That's a flavor that rings bells for me. And, you know. Well, I'm, I'm pleased that it does yeah. because uh, I think otherwise what I'm saying you know, could well be dismissed as being a bit loony. Um. <laughs> not at all, not at all, not at all. I think, uh, I, I'm not sure what I want to say. Uh, comes off the back of the beautiful, but it's just to say um, it's your work and it's very recognizably your work, and that isn't to some extent surprising. No, o across the different things that you actually do in the different uh, bits of different uh, technologies, that something. it's you yeah. Yeah. seems well, that's why it's art. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting, yeah, certainly. Uh, when I went to, to start to look at the video that um, because that was a, basically a PhD in uh, computer science and electronic engineering. Bit of a mouthful, I know. But, but I went in looking, thinking I was going to be looking at gesture, thinking I was going to be looking at, at um, whether the three-dimensional drawing techniques are a way of just um, thinking about gesture and, I thought, and looking at the techniques themselves. But of course I ended up going back to something a bit more fundamental, which is, well, what is the space of gesture or the space of interaction, sort of a bit more like uh, fundamental. Um, so yeah, a lot of points that ring bells. Sorry, I just want to ask, what are the sort of governing factors you use to choose the instruments of your drawing? Availability being the... I mean, for example, you use biro and do that blindfolded or in the in blind. But if you used a pen, you wouldn't be able to get the clarity of line. You'd get smudging and all that sort of business. You might do, yeah. I mean, the, the, at that point, the criteria was I need a sheet that's big enough so you don't hit the edges. Yeah. Um, I need a piece of blue tack. Um, yeah. I can feel. Um, and also smooth paper. So that you don't have the feedback from, say, a rough surface. Right, got you. So because that has a temporal quality to it if, when you're moving across. Yeah. It. Um, and if you have a, a biro, of course, it's going to roll over a smooth surface in a consistent way. Yeah. Where if you use a fountain pen, it's just going to be a bit like. You know, yeah, it's going to get messy. Yeah. Yeah. Which right. is fine. I, uh, mess is fine, but um, in a in a conscious way, um, before you get to it, if you can plan for it and. Uh, mm. I mean, how ritualistic do you get about it before you actually start a work? Um, on a scale of 1 to 10? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, we, I think like lots of people, I just sit down and, and I have to design the process before I can make anything. Yeah. Yeah. It's just that some people get very fussy about the biro they use and all that sort of business. No. no. I did. I made some set of my own pens a while ago, <laughs> which yeah. has got... Um, they're like... Um, if artists pigment in it rather than yeah rather than just the stuff because this this stuff will all fade you know yes exactly so yeah. and I'm just using them until they conk out really right so. thank you um, I'm interested in the in the issue of movement um, and uh, like your first, the drawings you showed at the beginning where maybe the object of study was a static object and you moved around and you felt exactly. around. Yeah. And in here you chose uh, an object that moves through time and in space. Yes. Um, like, um, what would be other, or are you interested in other forms of movement and what would this be and also how would you deal with it? Because here it seems like uh, time is uh, segmented into kind of the same, uh, I don't know, the, how is it called, like uh, stills, films, film stills, 
Like oh, like, um, yeah, like key points or something, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then you were saying that uh, the final object would be maybe like a book. So, uh, I've, yes. yeah, what, what would be other moving, are there any other moving uh, objects of study and like how would you deal with the final, yeah. producing the final uh, object? Yeah, um, well, like the water would be another example, the waterfalls that I, I showed. So that's uh, inherently uh, moving. Um, um, well, the wall drawings was one way around that, was to show not just one finished wall drawing, or, but uh, how it sort of uh, evolved. So you, the, the different stages of that same drawing. So, and that, in a sense, when you put them all together, rather like the blindfold drawings when you have a series of them, put them all together, um, you know, it's the human eye kind of animates it for you. You don't have to have it actually moving, but it, the, the human brain, the human eye does the rest for you, you know. Um, so, the, and the, the stereoscopic stuff um, is another way of bringing movement, maybe, into that area. But um, the thing that that taught me, that whole thing, was that you know you don't necessarily need to have actual stereoscopic depth to be able to appreciate space. So that pattern can have the same effect. Um, you know, the gestalt of something it can have be spatial. Um, so. There's no real one answer to that question, I'm afraid. But yeah, you could draw people for the rest of one's life, couldn't you? <laughs> um, but uh, there, are, of course, there are, you know, as people were saying, there are lots of different choices of medium. But I don't, don't know if I would bring, um, I would bring my own f sensibility to that. But another thing that is also really rich at the moment is to to work in collaboration. So it's not just me, but other people. And they would have their own ideas about that. So, um, you know, like if, if some of these, this is a standard form of illustration, like a comic really, isn't it? Except it's arranged vertically here, which is not how it was in the original. And it's, um, it's my redrawing of, of, of a rather bad uh, photoshopped uh, thing in an article. So I'm just trying to. So I've been studying thing, drawings like this and trying to work out what's really going on. Um, but that's enough for some people. Um, yeah. Um, I suppose I was interested in the idea of gesture in relation to the work, because I suppose often when people talk about gesture in art, it's seen as a sort of autographic. Um, subjective thing and I suppose it feels like there's a kind of diagrammatic approach in the work to some extent in some pieces and also through the kind of repetition of something whether it's a mark that's m made repeatedly or a draw or several drawings in sequence this it, there feels like through that repetition maybe there's a an impulse to distance yourself from a sort of idiosyncrasy or a kind of autographic mark, perhaps. I don't know. I was interested to know how you felt about the idea of the work being subjective or objective yeah. and whether there was a, yeah, whether there was a desire for some sort of objectivity and whether also, well, what it meant in, what you thought it meant to be an artist now making very schematic work mm. and making work that well, maybe you're on maybe on some level you're almost trying to sometimes mechanize it or turn yourself into something mm. like a machine mm. well, I wouldn't say that because I don't think you can ever <laughs> eradicate the interesting bits of yourself that will always creep out in some interesting way onto the page and I mean the, the disadvantage of a slideshow of course is it does flatten everything if I had the drawings here, then you could come and look and you could, you know, see the, the, the person in it. But you, you're right, there is a, a, a sort of a, uh, it's almost like a dichotomy, isn't it? So on one hand, you want, you want the, the gesture to be recorded in some way, the, the mov movement. And the other hand, you want to study it and understand it and maybe not even so much schematize it, but um, um, present it in a way back to yourself. So it's fresh, you know, and you have a, uh, a new angle on it. It's the point of making wall drawings. So you change the scale, you, you change the parameters, and, um, and then it starts afresh. Um, but, 
Yeah, it's just, I, I don't understand. And my, my training was in philosophy, so I, I have that kind of that side to me anyway. But the reason I started doing blindfold stuff was to get away from thinking. You know, so I just didn't want to think too much. I didn't want to have to make, um, you know, uh, I didn't want to have to read any more books. I didn't want to have to, I just wanted to use my hands. So, and I wanted to draw things. I mean, I'm not sure philosophy is quite so easy to make. No. Slapped off. I mean, because you know, it seems to me what, partly what you do, um, in a funny way, is to make philosophy more tactile. I mean, you know, we can see after what you've said that what we're looking at up there, which people might describe as, you know, diagrammatic uh, ways of showing people making gestures, yeah. is actually, in your turn, they're not making gestures that those are representations of people making gestures. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And therefore, it still leaves unresolved mm. what the gesture is right. it makes. Yeah. When one, when one so-called makes a gesture, that's a representation of a gesture. Yeah, it's not absolutely. as yet the yeah. gesture. And, uh, so something that fabrication feels itself towards is where the gesture is. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think you're right because even in gesture, there are there are um, iconic gestures, and those are. <laughs> so uh, even <laughs> we can continue that over over a glass of wine. So it seems like to me that. Uh, um, the difference is um, your work is a trace of hands movement as a drawing as compared to making the drawing look like something else. So if I were to understand your work from that point of view, I wonder if you have thought about, about well, I, I have two things. I wonder if you have thought about manuscript. So after all, manuscript is a trace mm -hmm. of hands movement. Yeah. But when we look at the manuscript, we come at it by the way of language. Yeah. So we know the rule of T looking like that. And combining T-H-I-S meaning this. this. But after all, that is a trace of a movement of the hand. So that's one um, thing I have. And another thing um, I want to ask is if you have thought about the reverse of time. Definitely. So, yeah. you know, you could, you could move your hand this way, but the result of, of that doesn't distinguish hand moved this way or that way. Yeah, that's some of the, some of the drawings I have, which I'm not showing you, but um, they are um, they're treating, they're taking uh, the gestures, if you like, and um, treating them as spaces that have been filled rather than as trajectories that are going one way. So if I was to make a gesture like that, most often that would be represented as an arrow doing that, with a little arrow head there. But in my case, I just simply join it into one space, so it becomes linked back to where it started from. So it's all one line. And um, so time is, you could still play with time within that, but um, so it's a bit unfair to show you only half of what I'm working on, but I should just reinforce that these are not, I'm not even sure if they are art, they're just actually warming up um, to take on the idiom of this cognitive scientist that I'm working with and to, to feed it back to them in a way that is using their own language, which is schematic um, and diagrammatic, um, and to feed it back to them in a, in a way that's enriched slightly. So um, that sort of answers your question a bit too. It's like, it might, this especially might seem schematic because um, the sources that they're based on, the, 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 um, the 
type of study that, that they attempt to address is schematic. And that's part of the problem of them. <laughs> Schematics are very dangerous, I think. But, but if you were to do an animation, like you said, you would be then producing yeah. spaces and so on, which came out of yeah. this, this analysis. Absolutely, yeah. Be completely live. And um, the, they, this can be not just my uh, interpretations, but other people's too. So it can be a um, the, w when you sh when you are looking at interaction, for example, the more opinions you have about what's going on, uh, like in cognitive science, they will look at the video. It won't be just one person's interpretation. There will be other coders who come along and take the coding and see if they can extract the same information from the video as the original researcher. So it might be that it's collaboration is another way. But I think I mean. On my understanding, this is animation. And in that sense, we can see a certain <coughs> problematic relationship between what would traditionally be called movement and animation. Right. Where animation is the animation of, to put it crudely, gesture. Mm -hmm. Movement um, would be something different. And here perhaps is where the aesthetic comes in. I mean, I can't think of it except in a very simple way that art historians make an enormous amount, far too much, I think, uh, about the Mybridge photographs. And they say, you see, it turned out all along that horses... Uh, when moving, don't have any of their feet on the ground. Uh, that may be the case, but it strikes me it's not the truth for, you know, in a sense, the purposes of animation hmm. are kind of different. Yeah. Uh, and the one's not reducible to the other, and one shouldn't be able to say, you know, oh, isn't it good that what we've been doing in art turns out to have been scientifically correct? I don't think that's yeah. neither good nor bad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, we should look more at the history of animation. I mean, I mean including Daffy Duck and Tom yeah. and Jerry. Yeah. Because it's there that you find a primitivism yeah. of the question of yeah. gesture. And also, you could you could look further back and to like really early art, prehistoric art. Yeah. Think of talking about movement and uh, caves in Lascaux, and how they use the, the shapes of the wall to to paint on in a way that suggests that some, an animal was coming towards you, for instance, or going around. Um, and yeah, I think um, there was another point I was going to say about well, the the the, the process you, you called it, I think, fabrication. But I sort of tend to call that the process, and I know it has a physical aspect. But um, the the idea of um, animation is uh, is something that I haven't. I'm not an animator, so I'm not exploring it in that in those terms. If that's what you're saying, but um, I have made animations, but I'm not an animator. I mean, traditionally, it comes up in the writings of Abbey Warburg, which is where you know. That's the issue. He's not concerned. He's concerned with animation, but in paintings. I mean, not in not in kind of real movement. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. yeah but it's, as you said, it's a very layered thing. If you look at the Greeks, they would choose moments. Um, the sort of uh, that would say that the moment at which the, you can see the discus thrower <coughs> is about. To throw that thing in his hand, you know that's that's been chosen to indicate that he's going in this direction and something's going to happen. Um, you, you can also take Freud, for instance, commissioned and uh, illustrated to do a drawing <laughs> of uh, Moses um, uh, by Michelangelo, and uh, but instead of just showing it just as it was, he showed it. Uh, he asked him to show it as it might have been, just before, just after, different states of affairs that could have maybe happened, and so. You bring the political and the spiritual into it too. 
Um, that's kind of animation too. That's an animation approach. But um, the drawings aren't that, that nice, but, uh, <laughs> but they are interesting. Um, so I don't know if I've gone off the question of the topic, but... Um, hmm. Is there a last Amazingly interesting Thank you. and very beautiful. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.